the panel that we're, we're going to be listening to right now is led by Yasmina Nikolic. And I want to uh, give the briefest possible introduction. Um, she is Agile Humans co-founder, an Agile organizational developer, trainer, and coach since 2010. She specialized Agile organizational culture, Agile education, and business and development integration. She holds a lot of titles in the Agile space uh, and certificates. But most importantly, she has a very proven record in Agile software development and beyond. Teaches Agile culture at the University of La Salle, Barcelona, and is a PhD candidate in the national culture models. She is also a member of the Serbian parliament from 2016 to 2018. Yes, Not anymore. <laughs> Thank you. Well, good afternoon. I'm really very glad that we have this opportunity uh, to talk about this uh, highly important topic uh, on career uh, develop um, developer, or on not only career paths, but also learning paths of the developers, because actually we are going to talk about human beings uh, that are the ultimate reality, because human beings are those that stand behind the products, make decisions about the products, and uh, combine their lives and their personal uh, growth with the uh, businesses and achievements of the companies uh, or the spaces they work within. So uh, I will be very quick in uh, explaining the topic and then I will give the floor to our panelists and to our audience because we want to engage you as much as possible and we want to hear from you your questions, uh, you opening them or even answering them. So we want to make this as interactive as possible. The topic is, um, as you probably, I mean, it's, it's, it's very important, like it's uh, how do we develop as, uh, as developers and uh, how do we learn to become these different titles and uh, enter into different roles and jobs and where do we end up in cycles. Let me give you a brief introduction because when we decided uh, that we want to have this panel, it was actually based on the abstracts we read from these three guys sitting uh, today with me. Uh, they were talking about life cycles, each of them about a different life cycle, about the beginners in the development, like juniors, and then the meteors, like the a bit older developers, and then uh, developers that I don't want to say the all developers, but let's say, as Michiel says, uh, the gray-haired developers. So we covered the three, the three uh, life cycles of, of developers, and I'm very glad that it happened because it happened spontaneously, and I'm pretty much sure we're going to have uh, a cool discussion uh, today. So we will try and answer topics such as, how do you figure out that we are stuck, that you are stuck? Uh, what are trade-offs between being a consultant, freelancer, business owner, architect, technical manager, and so on? How and where do we learn and acquire new skills? How do we choose our next career move? What are the prospects of older developers? And so on. So let me start this panel by inviting our panelists. Uh, and that is Michel from Netherlands. Uh, did I say your uh, name right? Close enough, yeah. Close enough, okay. And then you were from Slovenia and Milan from Croatia. Let's give them brief applause. So I'll invite them to introduce themselves through explaining their career and learning paths. Okay? Michal. So I'm Michiel. Um, right now I'm 37. But back when I was like eight years old, I wanted to become a cook like cooking stuff that seems so fascinating just to make something for other people. Then when I turned 12, I found this really magnificent book. It was about basic programming. Awesome. I just the idea that you could actually tell a computer to do something for you was awesome. Uh, when I turned 13, we got a computer, so I got to try out what was in the book. And um, it, I think it changed my life. So I decided not to become a writer, not to become a psychologist, but become a programmer, as you called it in those days. So I went to uh, university, um, did some stuff, then life got in the way, went back to university and got some really interesting jobs in the meantime. So um, I, I tried test engineering, I tried Windows programming in, in the days when it was still a thing. Um, and then I more or less rolled into web development and at some point I got to co-found a company with a, a former boss of mine. And um, we were at the head of this company 
and uh, I was faced with all these business decisions. So um, I noticed I slowly was coming from this boy that wanted to be a cook through fascination um, of computers into this field of big decisions and, and the real um, reality of, of software. And that's where I'm now right now. Um, I actually quit um, active participation in the company and now chose a different path. Uh, but I will um, tell you more later on. Thank you, Jure. So I actually did get to study sociology, finished that, then I became a blogger. Why was that? That was a thing. U user experience designer. And then at some point, web got big. And now I do a f I'm a CTO, full stack web developer for a number of foreign companies. And everybody's happy if you can write code. And that's good money. But I think the future for me holds in doing businessy stuff with code, so maybe either running non-IT company, but because everything is software, we'll figure out what we'll do with that. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Milan. I come, I come from Croatia. Well, um, my career basically started 2003 when I had my huge CRT monitor display and unbreakable wheel to do something with it. And my mom had a company, company which I own today was a tailor shop, basically. She was doing that at that time. And wanted to quit that and find another job, and she asked me what we will do with the company. So I said, I'll do something. I'm, I didn't have a clue that we could say that it was a startup, basically. But um, yeah, and until then, up until now, we, were, we covered the uh, fields from uh, Hardware, uh, network maintenance, web development, and digital marketing. Basically, today, Offer is a company which can cover all those things. It's around 15 people. Uh, and yeah, we are, we, are, we, are, we are handling all those situations, um, challenges with the young people, recruiting them, and so on. Uh, apart from that, I uh, finished PhD in two 2013 in the ICT applied, uh, ICT applied in education. Thank you. Well, before I go to my first question, um, I will uh, just give a short explanation if there is Nemanja in the room. There is Nemanja in the room. So Nemanja holds these index cards. And if you feel like uh, writing down your question for the panelists, you can do that during the discussion. And then Nemanja will bring it to me, and I will read it. And then, of course, we will have some audience time, and then you can ask your questions uh, just by asking it directly. It depends on how you feel. OK, so if you need index cards, they are with Nemanja. And then you, Nemanja will bring, it, uh, will bring it to me, and I'll read it. Thanks. So first question for you guys. We all know that programming uh, is a relatively uh, young uh, field subject, uh, subject to disruptions. There are many, many job titles. They're like totally crazy, and no one understands them. And uh, one of my favorites, for example, is the product owner, because you know the product owner is uh, somebody that you don't know exactly uh, you know, <laughs> what is the skill set of a product owner because needs to know the business uh, domain, then needs some uh, te technical knowledge, and of course this uh, mysterious skill called uh, people skill. Uh, so uh, it's very complicated, and then there's no uh, formal education organization where you can learn that. You have to go to some informal and so on. So um, we all know uh, that there are many, many, many career paths as yours, like where we've seen pizza delivery uh, per people that you know become uh, software developers and uh, some actors becoming business analysts and so on. But my question actually is, is there uh, a typical uh, development career path and learning path? Is there such a thing? What do you say? Well, I think um, most people have this preset opinion about this, that the typical path is going to be you are like 12, then you get fascinated by computers rather than people. Then you start just hacking <laughs> your way through your um, adolescence. And um, at some point, you have to decide on studies, and you're going to do that. And then you get a job instantly, don't finish school, and just go in there and get rich quickly. I think that's more or less the, the path as it's been considered. Um, but I don't think people have a, a clear image of what happens afterwards. So you, you enter the domain of development, and then stuff just 
starts getting wild. It's no longer this game that you thought it was. Um, it's serious stuff. And I don't think there's any conventional path, apart from the idea that people have that you have to become a manager as quickly as possible and then multiply the number of cars in your garage, and um, that's probably it. Well, I, I would add to that. I mean, as soon as you enter workforce and you start, you know, you start being a code, what is a code monkey, <laughs> and people scream at you and give you tasks, and then you learn the ropes, and you get people reporting to you, and then you wake up 10 years later with a small child or three. Um, you're in meetings all day, and you have to write reports in the evening, and you know, you're know you thinking, is this my life until I die, or the company is, got, is bought by IBM and they shut us down? <laughs> um, what will I do then? So I think that's pretty a normal horror story for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. In uh, our company, we had a guy who, was, who <laughs> followed your dream. He was a cook. Really? Yeah, he was. Uh, at the time when he arrived to the company, he was a cook. And he was working, he was, uh, working on a seacoast in Croatia and for two years. And then he realized that that's it. That's the far as he can go. And he wasn't uh, satisfied with that. And arrived to the company when he uh, asked me, can he learn something? He has will and, and, uh, and, and free time, spare time. And I asked him, what do you expect for, for pay, for, for paycheck, for, for starters? That's just, well, I don't know, give me something for a beer and I will learn that. And last autumn he left the company, he was bought by a bigger company and uh, of course ran away. Uh, but uh, that's the great story how he became a cook and realized that he can switch career. Basically, that was maybe the answer that there's no general way how we can succeed or make a, a, a career out in IT. But in general, I would say that if we uh, follow our dreams, have when we see spark in eye in, in someone when he talks about IT or any subject in general, that's the thing you need to follow. Mm -hmm. Whether that will be cook or, 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 or programmer or developer, whatever. I think that's really interesting. Uh, you mentioned the cook, but in, in the, the early days of my career, um, like half of the people in the field were actually not developers at all. They used to be chemists. They used to be, um, well, even poets. I've met poets that went into programming. Um, uh, it was more like a rule than an exception that people would not have formal education in IT. And at some point, I think uh, things changed when it became more popular to get formal education. Now it's more or less normal that you find people with education in well, software development even. Um, and it's a strange thing to notice that somebody has this like cook background. But I think in a way it was really quite refreshing to have somebody that was able to talk about stuff um, from this totally different perspective. But maybe we, we don't need to go to the formal education here in this panel because we, we can discuss is it uh, adjusted to market needs or is it not? But Let's leave it for another panel. No, <laughs> no. we'll go into formal no, education. But I, 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 I can do, tell I, you. I do, I do wonder, like from the audience, like can people raise their hands if they consider they have formal education in their job? Like for the job they do, do you have a formal education? What? They were required to have the formal wow. education. That's you were required. Interesting. Really? Hmm. Yeah. It's funny. Yeah, let me tell you something. What I'm discovering is, because uh, the question was actually about the career and the learning paths, like how do you grow further? It doesn't matter if it's uh, hierarchical growth or it's just like, the, you know, disruptive growth. Uh, how do you grow? That's the question. What, what are the learning paths? Uh, what brings you uh, or takes you further on into a career? Is it a motivation? Is it uh, just a new job uh, opportunity? Is it working with a colleague? Is it uh, where do you find knowledge and skills? How do you train yourself or how do you get the proper training if it's about training and stuff like that? Because I discovered by analyzing some agile coach uh, jobs that uh, formal education is not needed anymore, absolutely. Maybe some bachelor degrees, uh, just like in case. And then, uh, then they would ask for some informal certification recognized on the market as uh, the relevant one or bringing some knowledge into the, the workplace. And then most of it, most of the requirements uh, are actually knowledge and skills like experience. So my question would be for all those people, where do they get the skills? So certification is not necessary anymore, it seems so. I mean, it can be relevant, but it's, and you know, it's just like something that you desired uh, for most of the jobs, I'm saying that are like new uh, in the market, 
and there are no uh, career paths. Career paths are just getting formed along. Now you have junior Scrum Masters and senior Scrum Masters. I don't know if you've seen that. So it's not just anymore the Scrum Master and stuff like that. So on one hand, it's about the seniority, the junior, medior, and senior, like the hierarchy of knowledge and skills, and how do you get there? And then on the other hand is how do you approach this vast knowledge and the cross-functionality and the T-shaped forms uh, many times asked from the... I know that you have something to say, I know that. So I have a brute force approach to that, which is take whatever money you make, put 20% aside, and just do random certifications and workshops. <laughs> like, for me, like, I don't do Agile, but this sounds useful, so I'm looking like maybe I can go to a random Agile conference around somewhere, and I'll learn something new. And then the next thing will be a Docker conference, and I don't know, maybe a cooking, like a professional cooking class, because there will be lessons that will be useful for this kind of weird compound role. So, mm -hmm. you know, unicorn, agile, product, wizard thing. Mm -hmm. It's really funny that you would mention because I, I felt like my entire time on the university was like this random course I picked because it didn't really feel all that relevant to what I was doing. I was starting work just like the first day of my, uh, my uh, period in college and it never really, well, felt like it was augmenting. It was, it was just there and it was, well, um, keeping me down, I would say. Um, <laughs> so that's quite it. I, I love that idea. Actually, I'm a dive master as well. I just tried doing that, and it was wonderful. You can all do that because I'm out of a job. If uh, you how, do. Did you, how did you use your uh, university knowledge? Um, I think it was actually, um, I later learned that it was like an extra layer on top of things. So in, instead of mm -hmm. teaching me what to do, it taught me um, to be more critical about stuff, and I knew some more inside stuff. But most importantly, I think it, it taught me to um, explore the, the, the meaning behind the stuff I was doing. So it was an extra layer of, um, uh, what, what do you say, extra layer of consciousness to me, mm -hmm. but not necessary mm -hmm. for being a code monkey that is. But. <laughs> Before I, we are getting questions. Before I get into reading these, uh, I just have one more question. And uh, the question is, uh, what happens with, are there any fears around career path and, and learning paths. Like what happens, there's this uh, mystical zone, dark zone of developers over 40. Like what happens there? Uh, <laughs> like what is the career path uh, for a person? And I can link that to the question we got actually. What happens uh, uh, to the developer uh, that doesn't want to go into management? Because it seems somehow that that's the typical path. So the question that we got is a very good one. It says, can you finish as a programmer or do you have to change to management? I'd say, uh, I'd say that at some point, uh, probably the developer will switch to some kind of consultancy because he or she doesn't have a power, will, or, or strength to, to follow up and to, to, to learn all those things and which are dynamically and constantly changed. So, I think that's just be more or less standard path to become some kind of consultant or, 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 or uh, mentor or something like that. And uh, well, what happens after 40, we'll see, or maybe someone else has a, a experience you're closest to that age, and what happens then? <laughs> <laughs> that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I've seen quite some people um, over 40 in my field already, and um, there's, there's different varieties of these people over 40. Some of them are just like youngsters, they're still enthusiastic about their field, and uh, I totally trust they will be developers until the age of well, whatever is pension. Um, but I've seen quite a bit of them that were actually turning into this um, like ma management role, and they totally burned up. So they were, actually, um, one of my managers just got a burnout, and then he went back to being developer because he felt better at that. So it's not a natural thing for people. And I've seen some of these tech people actually went into a different business, so they just like became a veterinarian or they turned into massage uh, therapy or that kind of stuff. But I think it's totally plausible to be a developer until the end of days, uh, but it requires some special kind of passion and attention to not turning grumpy. I think that's the most important one. <laughs> because that's not a natural thing. Actually, I, I, I notice it in myself, I'm, I'm getting older and getting grumpier, uh, which is a thing to be very conscious about. I agree. And I, I, th I think you can get this abstract title, which is like analyst or architect or 
scrum master, I guess. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> which means you kind of understand code, but you're there to shield people from management. And at the same time, you don't have to manage it. You're just a shield. Maybe that's one of the fears. We missed uh, the answer for your question. What yes. are the fears? Mm -hmm. Maybe one of the fears is fear, how long can I do that? Mm -hmm. for, for how long, basically, I can do that. And maybe other fear would be um, to how to deal with people if I switch from the developer to the management, to the consultancy. How will I manage with uh, other people, younger people who knows maybe more than I do? So the question you get is, and what if I don't want to manage people? I want to be, you know, continue being programmer. From my point of view, it's possible. Like, nothing stops you. You can go on and uh, grow further on. Uh, it's just like a bit of a buzz, I think. Uh, but that's my opinion. I think I once heard somebody say something interesting about this. He said that um, a lot of people go into IT as, a, as an avoidance strategy. So they, ha they avoid by this to actually face all these um, social issues, so like uh, facing people, um, developing as a social human being, uh, which is not a bad thing, it's just, um, well, everyone chooses a path. But at some point, you really have to face these things, and depending on what the outcome is of this, well, um, crisis, really, um, you can emerge as a really good developer, or you will turn into a manager, or you will just become a veterinarian. But I think this, this crisis is necessary to evolve as a, as a developer. I think the path for an older developer is to switch jobs. So if you're an, you have to start working with older people. If you're in a startup full of young people without families, it's going to be crazy and you're not going to fit in. The older you are, you need more established companies or you need to do startups with older people that respect their life. And then, then suddenly you discover that this whole new world of people that don't go to meetups and then don't code all night, but they do sane programming at the same pace. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, I'm over 40. I think that there's, there's two factors. There's the environment and there's the physiology, really. When you turn older, you, your mind just changes. And for a doctor, that might be, well, it, it happens. It's not a bad thing. It just evolves or it, it, it ripens, um, whatever you like to say. So I think you, you turn less agile, then you get this whole family thing, which just drags you uh, down. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, kids. <laughs> So um, I, I think you just change, and um, I would more liken it to being a professional soccer player, for instance, where you have this physical set of skills that you really need to, to excel at your field, and then at some later point you just, well, physiologically speaking or um, um, socially speaking, you just change, and you, you're not able to uh, compete with the best, and you, well, you, you might become a coach or just a hobby player or whatever you do. Um, I don't think that's... That goes for everyone, um, but there's this, this environment as well, the context of, of your colleagues, for instance, that might just make you feel old, or they declare you to be old, or uh, force you into a role like you're being this uh, genius, or you're being this, this old grumpy guy, and this will form you as well. So I think um, it's different from being a doctor, in the sense that if you're a doctor, then probably you, you will become more respected as you go. I think that's more or less uh, a social thing. Uh, whereas developers are, by their environment, considered to be old and weird and what you're doing here. It's, it's very much a youngster environment. Mm -hmm. It's a hype, basically, uh, current situation. Right. We had more over 40 interested in answering this question. You can take the mic, too. Sorry? Um, well, Nothing I can tell you. <laughs> there's a place for everyone. 
Um, but well, there's nothing wrong with being grumpy. I like it. Um, but I think uh, you have to be, be careful not to make it your um, who you are or what you feel. If you're grumpy, you get cynical, and then at some point you get depressed. You can just act grumpy as long as you're just happy inside, I think. Because it can be just an act. I'm happy when I raise your face. That's fine. Or maybe you're less, less, less flexible Over 40. working. Sorry, go on. Le less flexible working with younger colleagues who are 20 and you, you don't have time to listen to them or you don't care about their life. Or you mean I have less time to bullshit. Exactly, thank you. <laughs> Over 40, hello. hello. I would agree. Hi, Over 40. <laughs> I would agree that uh, the, there was a nice, nice sentence said it's a hype, and this is there's something we have to do about it. There are, uh, I, I, <laughs> there I know I know uh, uh, magnificent developers over 40. I have one in my office that uh, most of the youngsters are very dedicated to him and eager to learn from him. On the other hand, uh, I see that. Um, uh, th th this, this has to be established, this kind of culture, and we have to somehow avoid the hype because it's a beautiful industry, it's not a hype. So I would that, just wanted to point out that beautiful mm -hmm. sentence. Great, thank you. So I'm pretty much sure you're going to have great time tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow, Michiel, at your session about the gray hairs. <laughs> uh, let's move on. Uh, we have uh, many questions coming in, and I'm going to combine the three of uh, questions, all right? One is, what is uh, motivation for you? Please tell us what motivates you to do things. Then the second one is, what about people who don't have real interest in IT, but with only motivation to get a paid job? And the third one that I think goes well with these two is what is the most important decision you've ever made uh, career-wise? Uh -huh. Those are tough questions. Uh, I, I, I don't think it's a bad thing to want to have a job. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> it's not like we ask people in service industry, like, do you, do you do this with passion and so on? There's like lots of jobs that are really professionalized and standardized so they work. Why can't most of the IT be like that? And then we leave it to the people that want to do crazy innovative stuff and be daring to do daring stuff and risk. Why is that a bad thing to kind of grow up as an industry? Also actually, uh, somebody w once told me that it doesn't really matter what you do. You should just try and love it because otherwise you're wasting your time. Um, and I think that's a good thing. It doesn't really matter whether you love your job. You can just make yourself love it, otherwise you're wasting your life. Um, so you can just learn to love being in IT, and more or less I hate it half of the time and, and love it on the other half. I think that's fine. It's a good balance. That sounds like a really great ratio, only, <laughs> love it, only hating it half the time. Yeah, that's, that's decent, I think, considering. We have, in every industry we have <coughs> people loving their jobs or hating their jobs, so it's natural. But again, since this is a industry in great hype and we all, uh, newspaper, media in general, are, are full of that, so basically we, 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 we are thinking about that. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe to switch to other question. Um, what was the, the best, or what motivates me? Uh, I was thinking that there was no day, okay, we have better or less better days, everyone. But uh, in general, I didn't have a feeling that I'm going to a work or that I need to go to the work. And I think that that motivates me because I love my job. And I love, love grow, to grow, to, to see company grows, to see the team grows, to see uh, that clients are satisfied, to, to, to make it uh, better or, or, or have constant progress in it. And basically, I think that's the, the, the best thing which drives me in every day. You are skipping an answer. What is the most important decision you've ever made? Actually, it's easy. Uh, I quit my job uh, several times. Those were really good decisions. <laughs> Not because I hated the job, but because we came after. Mm -hmm. So quit your jobs. I would say like every time I force myself to invest into communications and people skills um, because more, the more I'm in IT, the more my 
professional successes come from communication with other, either businesses, other developers, workshops that I lead. And I could never do that if I would just be looking at my code editor. I'd say even maybe it would sound like something uh, standard, uh, but uh, the thing that, uh, which uh, was the decision is that, uh, that I took over the company and started to go in it, to dive in it, and um, that I had open mind in it. I didn't know what to expect, to expect un unexpected, and it came good. Yeah. And it is still good, it's good. So in a way, you answer the next question. How did you get your first job? How uh, did you get your I first job? I created one. <laughs> you created one? <laughs> yeah, I was recruited. Like, I was already doing so many things that somebody just started paying me. Actually, I think like three months in college, um, um, a friend of mine just pointed me at some ad and said, uh, she said, that's going to be a really nice job for you. Just, why don't you just go there? And then I did, and that was my first job because I got hired instantly. That was out of your comfort zone. Um, in the sense that I never had a job in IT before, yes. Oh. And actually, it was, it was going to be about being an editor for a magazine. So it was out of my comfort zone a, a little. Yeah. But it was great. <laughs> what I would just like to point out here is how much privilege we have as developers in this industry. And you know, I think it would be good for us to reflect on that re regularly and figure out how can we do, use that power to grow, either us, ourselves, or within our communities, because I'm not sure it's going to last, but while it is, we could make more impact with it. I think it's a challenge to, to explain to younger people that it's not all great stuff, because Yes, there are privileges. We can work whenever we want, basically, if we are stick to the deadline. And, uh, or we can uh, build a product which works or doesn't work, but it's great. We are, we are building something. And those young people are often just see, okay, he had an idea. He has a startup and millions. And this space in between is uh, what? Work, tears, sweat, whatever, blood. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, they don't see it. And I think it's a big challenge to explain to them that that gap is a real pain in the ass. And if you manage to skip it over, then you can enjoy your millions or planes or whatever. Let me ask you a slightly different question. How did you get your second job? Same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got bored in the first one and quit. And did you look for the second one or you got recruited? No, I mean, there's so much recruiting going on, it's why, why would we mm -hmm. look for job? <laughs> it, it's, the, it's the privilege, right? But it's also kind of a curse because you don't have time to kind of find yourself or think about it. Be you know, you quit at one web shop and you have a job in another tomorrow. Whereas if maybe you take, took some time, mm -hmm. looked around, you could figure out different opportunities and reflect on that. I'm boring then, I, I'm, I'm still on my first job, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and the other job which I'm having is a lecturer on two private faculties. And that is basically extension of what I do in a, in a company. Then I'd like to teach that through um, IT in education or entrepreneurship or something like that. Well, that's very interesting yeah. because we won't go there now because we have a lot of questions. I really want to cover them all. But just a remark uh, that we spoke about wh while preparing for the panel that there is also uh, this need to talk about the second jobs because it's you know not just the one job. We have two jobs nowadays and two career paths. And uh, the thing gets more complicated. Uh, switching the topic now. Uh, let's go a bit into uh, talking uh, how do you uh, maintain your work-life balance. And we have uh, this question from uh, the audience saying, have you ever had second thoughts about your career path uh, that you've chosen and how to balance between building career and private family life? Any experience there? Actually, uh, at one point when I was working for a company, I wrote a blog for the company um, saying that I loved my nine to five mentality. 
and the, the boss actually was okay with me publishing it. I think that's something that you, you might want to consider um, making your own, just this nine to five mentality, where you start at nine or whatever time and quit at five and just make it your thing rather than this um, weird conception we have that you have to make like 80 hours a week to be successful. I think that's, that's in the end going to kill you. And if you can't get your work done in like 40 hours, it's not going to work in 60 or 80 either. Um, there's some people that are physically or mentally able to do 80 hour work weeks. Um, I think it's a small percentage and they're really, really successful. But um, I think for most people, it's way better just to say, um, I will just quit my job uh, at five and the next day uh, I will be there again. Make it like a recognizable um, break in your day and don't work at night if you don't really have to. Mm -hmm. I think that for me, like having classes, activities, sports in the afternoon, because that forces me if there's, you know, if there's a group of people waiting for me at the, at the you know, basketball court at five o'clock, life has to adapt to that. Or, you know, your dog waits for you, your family waits for you at home. So these kind of external things happens to all of us as we kind of grow older. But I think it's also the, when the reality of industry hits us, as like the third time you see the project go bad, you go, okay, <laughs> this is going to happen the fourth, the fifth, the tenth time, and you stop caring so much about, you, you stop <laughs> drinking the Kool-Aid. <laughs> And then, it, the, then the work-life balance becomes much easier. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a real challenge to, to, to optimize and balance those things, definitely. Uh, I got married two years ago and got son this year. And especially second part, this second part was uh, challenging again because I couldn't have my peace in... in, in nine or 11 in the evening to write an email or to report or whatever, because someone was crying. And then I shifted everything through whole day and I needed to leave that space for him or, or work even later in the night when he is asleep. So it's uh, every part of our lives, our, uh, our, our, our life is having and taking own um, uh, need for adaptation and same goes for here and I think that um, if we find that uh, optimal balance between uh, 9 to 5 or 9 to whatever and, and, and whenever some free time and enjoying in that balance uh, that's the best thing to go with and uh, enjoy the life so let me tell you about something about the work and life balance. I was wondering, could I bring my dog here today? <laughs> because it's with me in the hotel room. <laughs> There's no one to take care of it. So it's complicated. It's really complicated. I don't mind. Uh, I don't mind that the boundaries uh, Actually, get messed I up. I once heard this great quote. Somebody said, "This nobody that while dying thought, I wish I'd worked more and they helped yeah. me. Mm. Mm. Uh, and most people think, oh, I wish I uh, spent more time with my family, doing the stuff I love. When that's the same, that's okay, but otherwise. No, it's funny. The other day, our, the colleague of ours, uh, she was uh, with us last night at the meetup, uh, Susan Daigle. Uh, she said to me, uh, after the first meetup meet we said in, uh, we have in Bel had in Belgrade, like, she couldn't sleep. And then I say, why? What happened? She says, you know, somehow I think that I was so happy that I really wanted it to be the morning already. So, like, just to continue. <laughs> <laughs> without sleeping. So yeah, that happens when you're passionate. Uh, I'd just like to add here, like, when I was working with startup, there was always this, this idea of exit, where we, where, where we make it big. And then it's an interesting practice you can do for yourself. Like, let's say I get, you know, half a million dollars this year. What would I change? Would I work less? How would my day look like? And, you know, and for me, that was like, okay, I would go to yoga in the morning, I would do some work, you know, I would go out for lunch with friends, maybe I would work two or three days a week, and so on, you know, on my projects. And then if you do that kind of exercise, you realize, oh, there are job profiles, you know, you could be a consultant, you could do remote work for some, from somewhere and stuff like that. And it turns out doing an exit within your career, it's already possible for I think more or less all of us here. But we need to move away from that moment to like, 
oh, how that look like and how can I bring that into now? Related to this, um, there's this question I had for the panel. How, and I, I think I didn't tell you the question. No, I didn't. How fast do software developers burn out in their career? And we got the question from the floor. Do you believe burnout comes from how quickly technology is changing? Example, JavaScript frame works hype. So only burnout is from JavaScript. Yeah. <laughs> if I got it <laughs> correctly. It's an example. I think burnouts come from forgetting about um, your inner self or what you really want to do in life and, and running around pretending you are doing the thing in your life you want to do. So I think you're the one to answer this question, really. I think burnout comes from culture that you're inside. Like if you're in a company that has steady business processes that you support and you're part of a great team, then things work out. If you're running around panicking, then you burn out. And if you can rec recognize that you're in a team that's toxic and that forces people to work 80 hours, then you will burn out. Burn out. But you need to have this kind of reflection feedback loop to prevent that. But it's cool to say that you burned out. Is it? I mean, it was never cool for me to burn out. <laughs> yeah, yeah so, you experience. Didn't, so you didn't burn out. But those guys, maybe, they, they feel more cool if they can say, listen, I burned out in this job and I will switch to Java or whatever. I think people, <laughs> <laughs> people might just try to, to, to make it. Uh, I think to burn no, out. No, I say, I say it, it could be possible. I think it, it's more like it's the, the reverse. Yeah, I think yeah, actually yeah. Um, people will say, um, will be proud about their burnout um, as a way to make an excuse because it, it's not cool. It's a really life changing experience and it's horrible in a way. Um, but um, I think it, it just comes with passion. So if you're really passionate about the job, then which is a thing some people are predisposed to, then there's always this risk of uh, a burnout, which is basically just overextending yourself. Um, mm -hmm. So in a way, if you're predisposed to burnout, it means you're a really passionate person as well. So it's a good thing, but you have to limit it. And then, mm -hmm. but most people don't, then you learn your limits and then you might just run into it again. Bal balancing, basically. How many of us uh, did the experience of the burnout or near burnout? Why not so many? Good, lucky the other ones. <laughs> okay, uh, we really have a lot of questions, so let's go through them. Uh, I have one large one, I really want to read it, uh, and sorry if I uh, have to focus a bit because the, it's uh, the small letter. So many programmers, it's the gray hair, you know. So many programmers <laughs> offer careers. Uh, no. Can I have help? <laughs> <laughs> Who's this question is? Yours? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's an important question. It's about ethics, but it's really hard to read it. You. Okay. Would you, would you like to read it loud, please? Is this also you? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, basically the question is about the, all the programs that offer uh, uh, career switch, or how is it called here, prequalificatie. Uh, uh, so, <laughs> so they they advertise that you will become a superhero of programming in six months. They they get uh, people's hopes up, and it's easy to get people's hopes up in Serbia because it's a very poor country. It's difficult to find job, and then somebody comes along and says, "Okay, you will become a super programmer in six months," and you just go for it, gather some money, pay for it, and then you get your hopes down again, and you lost your money. And uh, where is the ethical boundary of uh, how is that advertised? So that basically that's the question. Thank you. I think if they replace these advertisements by you can become a dancer or a uh, drug dealer, then you would never believe them. But uh, they're more or less the same. <laughs> it will never um, be good for you. My honest opinion. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's obviously a scam. So why would that be? Um, I think maybe as, 
I mean, the most obvious answer is the industry should provide standards and unions and all that stuff, but we know that's, that's a fairy tale. So I think it's just reality. That scam's gonna happen. We'll have to live with that. And do you know maybe how successful they are in attracting uh, 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 people to those quite? I think that maybe marketing sometime will recognize that those schools or institutes or whatever they are are bullshit and so the people will check, oh, okay, did you go there and how was it and did you find a job after that? Maybe that can eliminate uh, 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 bad ones, but they will be always the same. I, I mean, look, there's so many MBA programs that are also scams. <laughs> And for some it's debatable, but a lot of them are clear scams. So if managed, and th those industries didn't also solve that. It's mostly just having mentors and doing a good job. In general, everything that sounds like a silver bullet solution is, mm. is a scam. So if it sounds mm. too good to be true, it most likely is. I can relate to that and then go to my next question. Yeah, because you know the agility, everybody talks about it like a silver bullet and it's definitely not. I mean, it, it will depend on many, many things. Uh, one of the things that I really find interesting, and uh, thanks for the question, is uh, how uh, the agile coaches, like what is the ratio between the soft skills and the technical skills in agile coaching? So uh, do you want to answer this? And I will add up then. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you, this is the question for me. So uh, I think it's uh, uh, the, the coaching itself, it's about people's skills. So uh, you, you really need to, to master them. You really need, and you can of course grow as, as a coach and you should. Then how do you do that? It's a separate question, I don't wanna enter there. But then the technical skills are very important because in order to understand what, uh, if, if people gather around the product. So you really need to understand what is uh, what they're making and what are the skills they need in terms of, of, of the specific knowledge and the specific skills around the, the, the product. So if you are ignoring that, you can't be a really good coach, that's my opinion. So you really need to master that as well, as much as possible. And um, that's the brief answer, so I don't want to make it longer than that. So if you have to add something. I think being a developer is like being a musical star. So if you want to be in a musical production and you're just able to sing, that's not gonna fly. So in the end, you need to be able to sing, to act, and to dance, and then you're going to be a great musical star. I think a lot of developers actually come in just being able to sing, um, and that just doesn't do it. So you have to learn about these other things, and we call them soft skills, but I think that's just too vague. Uh, you just n need to learn about some other stuff than just the passion you have about singing. Uh, you should, well, you have to overcome your fear of dancing, which is always a little awkward. And then acting is, is a totally weird thing. But I think acting is a really important part of being a developer. You need to, well, pretend to be interested in, 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 in projects. <laughs> you need, need to be nice to your boss and you need to, well... Manipulate. Sorry? Manipulate. And manipulate. I think manipulation is a really important part of the job as well. Um, <laughs> and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think uh, that's why soft skills are so important. Mm. And it will depend again, the career paths are strange because many developers become scrum masters, now junior and senior, and then they, they grow into agile coaches, whatever the agile coach is, and uh, so on. But then you have people that come uh, uh, from outside the development that become the scrum masters, such as psychologists or you know, uh, whatever other discipline, could be anything. So they can't and sing, but they can dance and they exactly. can Exactly, yeah. yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have similar questions uh, with the ratio. So it's uh, engineer, engineer uh, versus developer. Is it enough just to code? My, my question is why would you just code? I mean, you know, like either you understand code or you don't. And if you can think in code, then you just add additional layers of knowledge and now you're a unicorn. Because you're a lawyer, you know, you're, people, you're a person with some law knowledge that can code and there's like almost no people that can do that. Small percentage. So why wouldn't you become a unicorn and stick to just coding <laughs> as an alternative? Yeah, maybe, maybe the question was uh, not just engineer. So you have a d developer uh, who does what you say, it needs mm -hmm. to be done. 
or you have real developer who can understand the whole process behind the application and everything else. Maybe that was the idea. Uh, so I'd say that it's th that understanding of the, the develop, uh, not development process, but uh, the project or, or the, a part of a project which he works on is something which comes with experience and then projects which are done and uh, everything else. But that's the extra layer, layer of uh, what needs to be added in, the, be, in being a developer for someone, right? Uh, do we have the owner of this question in the room? Do you want to clarify? Uh, yes, I want to clarify, and I think it uh, connects with the uh, musical star. So uh, I, it, I meant uh, people skills are good, and they are useful, but um, I'm not very good at them. <laughs> but uh, I think that if you just think code, um, then this is maybe just the first step. But then if you think uh, like uh, as an engineer, then we talk about your mindset, I would say. So. Um, uh, not, you, you can just learn the syntax and learn how to code and what are the coding rules and then you write something and then some, something, something comes up on the screen. Then if you're an, an engineer, then you think wider. This is something that those, those uh, scam schools will not teach you. And this is how um, the architecture is set up. Why set up is like that? How is, does that influence your code? It mm -hmm. has been said that you know, engineers have an agile mind. Then, uh, again, understanding why are you using this programming language, for example, this technology and not some other technology. So engineer in that sense, if you, is that clarification enough? Yeah, so, so what you're saying is that there's, there's more to soft skills, so to speak, than just these, um, these people skills. Soft skills might involve knowing when to use what technology or when to No, use soft skills aside. Just, yeah, there's like these coding skills are and then to. thinking as an engineer. Hmm. And this, I mean, when I say thinking as an engineer, I think that, uh, in technical terms. So these are not soft skills. This is something that you're an engineer. You think about the product and what is the best technology mm -hmm. and how to improve that technology and that this architecture that we have is old and we should have a new one and my code doesn't work because just... I, actually, I heard this interview on, on Ray a few weeks ago. There's a Dutch company that specializes in testing, test engineering, really. So that's a, a part of coding or a part of, a part of development. And they hired only people with autism because they felt that these people were able to focus more than have everyone else. Um, I'm not sure that every company should do that, but um, it was a really interesting thing to notice. Um, not, not every job requires soft skills, and sometimes it can even get in the way uh, of doing your job properly. If you have a team with a lot of social people, then they will be just drinking beer all the time and partying. Mm. You need to get work done as well. And I think that's where, where being an engineer can be perfectly fine, uh, as long as your skills are like, uh, up to an acceptable level. They know that you don't need to be um, some sort of a miracle and, um, and, and be social like hell. Uh, but just don't kill your, your fellow workers. That, that, that might be sufficient. So we have only seven minutes left. Uh, we will have to go back to some questions, uh, the topics, because we got some questions uh, related to them. But uh, let me... Uh, uh, let me ask you something that we got from the floor and sounds uh, interesting, uh, which is, did you earn your first million? <laughs> not yet. <laughs> yeah, not, not yet. Not even close. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any plans? Do you think uh, that way? I'd say it's, it's, it's not something that drives, me, you. drives yeah. me that I need to have a million or, or whatever. Yuri is thinking. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm thinking, oh, you, you, yeah. yeah, you don't actually need that much. Like, if you can figure out what you need, the number is much lower and much more achievable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How many? Yeah, it's quite interesting, um, thinking about money. I think that's the easy way to think about your future, to think about the amount of money you want and then try and get that, but I think what you said is way more important to think about what you want to do or accomplish and to see what you need for that. And most likely you don't need much for that at all. Um, and the times I've been thinking about money were, were usually because I felt that the thing I really wanted to do was not going to earn, him, earn me a dime and I needed a, a way to still be able to do that. And I mm -hmm. think what you said is really inspiring. 
just see if there's a way to do that right now rather than wishing you had half a million and be able to live your dream because mm. by the time you might well be dead yeah <laughs> you might be yeah that's true okay so uh wrapping up uh i'm trying to relate these questions i have in my hands uh somehow and it goes back uh, to maturity and uh, quality um uh, coming from the different topics we covered. So uh, we have this statement that I really like, uh, which is doctors have many successes. So going back to why uh, the 60-year-old doctor could be you know, uh, better than the 40. Uh, uh, IT experts may be less, and not so much track record, so less respect. Uh, what, there might be something in this, uh, because what I've noticed working with the organizations, when they actually they push developers over some age into more responsible roles, because they get older and they have more knowledge, more experience, they know better the product and the domain. So there are no good managers that know how to manage in this new digital world. So people coming from the software development that grew up into senior positions somehow are the ones, the chosen ones. Uh, and many people don't want that, but some people do want that. And then the question would be how to recognize, you know, how to, to, uh, uh, how to provide for those that would like to go that way and for those that wouldn't. So it is about maturity in the digital world, I think. So we will have to wait a bit more to see where it ends and how does that transform. How does that transform? And then uh, the question related to this one was the one that we got about, I think I got it about the, do you believe in coaches younger than, let's say, 35, and their ability to coach good and for real? So it's a very hard question, I have to say, because I don't think it's age-related at all. Uh, it still has to do a lot with the experience and with the mindset. It can't be at odds with the mindset uh, that we want or we need to promote and live in uh, these super fast times. So, uh, yes, somebody that's younger uh, th than 35 can be an excellent coach, and people with over 50 can be awful coaches. Depends on the context and depends on what you really believe in and what your assumptions are and how willing you are to be proactive and uh, how well you understand the no, no of micromanagement. Like, you really need to understand how to collaborate with people and where your, where, where your role is. I hope I answered this question. I find it, it's a precious uh, question, so I hope I, I answered it well. Then we have um, these questions that I will let you answer. Uh, do you think maturation of IT industry will change situation? And um, the question about senior developers coming into the jobs or workplaces that they are called seniors, but they don't have senior qualities or senior skills and still something is lacking there. So actually it's about how do we know uh, what the senior level is and uh, how do we check that before we accept it as a given? It's a really also tough question. It, it depends on the company, on the project, on the client which we are dealing with. And um, I'd say that the full approach of the person can be uh, 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 clarified as the senior or, or junior or experienced or whatever. Same as for the coaching of the person of 35 or 65. Uh, depends whether that person can coach in general. Same goes for here. If, if the person have approach of the senior, not just the, so not just the technical knowledge and uh, ability to solve problems or to develop a good code or provide a good code, but also to, to understand the problem, to know how to uh, um, deal with the customer, deal with the problems, that maybe handle the team, maybe. So that could go through to, to the uh, skills which are needed in order to person to be called senior. Mm -hmm. I think that industry as a whole needs to grow up. Like, what kind of job ads are where we say we have a foosball table, a pool table, there's a beer keg at the office, happy hours. Like, what, what, this is not a college or, you know, a university, early stuff. <laughs> and, and, like, you don't see, you know, electrical engineers 
ads having that. I, you know, I never said or architects, like in our architectural bureau, we have the best pool table. You know, we need to grow up, we need to take our, our jobs as, you know, we're professionals, this is a prof professional trade. We come, we do our job, we have standards. If they're not standards, we figure them out. And then we go home, we're, we're not, I mean, why is there so many TV ads in the hallway promoting that they have the best stuff in the office? That's weird, at least to me. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I agree. <laughs> but I think we're just basically all big kids, and that's where we started because of the passion and, and the toying around, and then at some point we just don't want to grow up. Uh, and what you say, um, we probably should. And we'll make us happier. Okay, now we have to close this. I kept this last question for the end. Time's up, you see. Uh, so this is about, uh, uh, I will, I'm going to ask you to, uh, to answer this question like with one sentence or two. Um, and it says, we have many new roles appearing and there's the example of the DevOps, uh, like DevOps. So the question would be, what can we do to be prepared for these fast changes? What do you think the people can do to prepare themselves, especially the young people entering the market, uh, to prepare for these fast changes, and not only fast changes, I would add up, like, uh, faster. <laughs> what to do? <laughs> Learn as soon as possible to adapt even quickly than older generations did. That was one sentence. Mm -hmm. Okay. Enough. I said one or two, but okay. Yeah. Trust, into, trust in yourself, I mean, when there's a need, you'll pick up a book and learn the, the buzzword thing. It's the same as the old buzzword thing. Um, I think just, um, never mind, just do your thing. I think um, you don't need to know everything. You will when it's necessary. Mm -hmm. well, great. Well, thank you all. Uh, I hope we have uh, enough food for thought. And now there's a break of 30 minutes. So if you want to mingle and talk to uh, our panelists and deepen the, the topics. You can do that here in this room or, or any place else. Well, it was really nice. Uh, it was an hour talk. Uh, I, I can imagine we could uh, go deeper into, into each of these, but uh, we don't have time. We have to be time boxed. Time is a very, very precious resource. So thank you so much. Uh -huh.